Georgia Virtue presents the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. This is episode 256, President's Day. This week we have Jailhouse Freezers, Rotten Totten, Urban Outdoorsmen, Keeping Gender Identity Out of Classrooms, and The Great Vape Debate. I'm Dave Roberts. With me is my partner in this endeavor, writer, journalist, dog mom, owner of the GeorgiaVirtue.com, Jessica Salaji. What's up, Dave? Howdy, howdy. How's your week? Oh, it's been exciting and interesting and lots of lots of local news this past week. What about you? Oh, man, there's been lots of local news, lots of national news. You got uh, balloons being shot down. Got, UFOs, uh, they say. Yeah, UFOs. They were, in fact, unidentified. Of course, they could have just asked the ham operators on one of them. Apparently, that was that was their balloon. I guess they bounced signals off of for uh, for civilian radio. And then you have uh, Fetterman, the potato, going to uh, Walter Reed and being treated inpatient for depression. But we're going to cover none of that today. <laughs> right. Yes. So if you are interested in that news, and it's also not on the Georgia Virtue, so good luck. Hope you can find a right. reliable source. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 you mean the senator from Pennsylvania <laughs> is, is not Georgia News? No, he's not on Georgia News. In that vein, Jessica, we have the first story, and I wrote the tagline on this one, what the hell is wrong with jailers? No, this is, this is out of Alabama. If that isn't everything you need to know. Yeah, I believe this 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 place is northwest of Birmingham. It, it would be considered Metro Birmingham, probably. So, the guy the guy has had he doesn't have anything anymore. He's dead. Uh, a drug problem, but apparently at some point the jailers were tired of his crap. Strapped him to a restraint chair, butt naked, and put him in a freezer. Step aside, Victor Hill. I mean, it's what Victor ugly. Hill did was 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 awful, and should never do that with somebody you have in custody. But this guy was froze to death when they finally got him aid, and this is like every other every other case of abuse that we see. That the, the guards and medical personnel are walking by, kind of pointing and laughing and stuff like that. It, it, his body temperature. His rectal body temperature was 72 degrees when he finally got to the got to the emergency room. That's horrific. They did not call 911. They put him in the back of a of a of a car and drove him to the ER. Mm-hmm. 72 degrees. Uh, there. My experience with hypothermia uh, uh, is limited, but I, I know. You can die in seventy degree water because water dissipates heat something like five times faster than air. You know, you lose you lose so much more heat through water. But as a as a Florida boy, I mean, I almost rather sweat to death than freeze to death like that. Butt naked, strapped to a chair. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's cool. and, and something else. I, yeah, it's something else I, talk, I talked to uh, the chief deputy about was how you know how does one keep his humanity in this type of work. And it, and for, for, for Chad Hunt, it's, it's his, his faith is, is kind of what would, would, would guides him and, and keeps him grounded with all this stuff. It's the same thing we saw with, uh, uh, the, the MPs in Iraq with, with detained prisoners and making naked pyramids and stuff like that is there's a dehumanizing process and I, and I know you get tired. Of, everybody says I'm dying. Everybody says I'm sick. Everybody says I can't breathe. I know that. But if they're going to be in your custody, you got to deal with that. Yes, you do. And uh, this guy was, uh, his name was Anthony, went by Tony Mitchell, who's 33 years old. Uh, it says there was in, he was in the kitchen's walk-in freezer or similar frigid, uh, 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 frigid environment and left him there for hours. Uh, it says as possibly as punishment for deputies who had had a time with Tony. 
So I'm guessing this is this is one of those guys that is probably known to law enforcement. He's he was probably not the best guy in the world, but as soon as the cuffs go on, that's it. Well, so I. The thing that's so bad is that, and and it's it's certainly warranted, but um, the public trust that breaks down as a result, and what it, the impact it has on um. Ev- like so much other stuff and. Talk about, I mean, why would someone want to go work there if that's the kind of news that's coming out of there? Like, you're talking about understaffing, which is a nationwide problem. Why would anyone want to go work there if that's the kind of news that's coming out of there? And and I'll ask you a rhetorical. Where the hell's Ben Crump? Uh, Not the right color. Right. But just as egregious, yeah. Yeah, absolutely horrible. But this it doesn't it doesn't fit the narrative, and that and that that annoys me. Is the the same people that show up at at other at at other abuse or abusive of power, other shootings, other other possible crimes by by officials shows up to those. But this one isn't sexy. It doesn't fit the narrative for them. And look, if I lived in this municipality, I'd be I'd be after the sheriff's butt. Because he may he may not have been involved in it, but he's responsible for it. Well, he created an environment that made these deputies think that was an okay thing to do. Right, or that there wouldn't be any repercussions. Right, and most times you got to wonder how many times have they done it? How many times have they got somebody out and throw them in the cell and say, do, uh, uh, "Mess with us again, we'll put you back in the freezer." And when they got out of jail, they said the, the guards were abusive to me. Everybody's like, oh, shut up. Every, every, everybody coming out of jail says that. Again, it's a complete erosion of public trust. It, it, it will, and it will linger for a long, long time. Yeah, it's the same thing you're dealing with down there with, with Brian Adams. Is that's a huge, I mean, that's a, you know, him being arrested. That, the stuff that, that's been going on in Smith State Prison is a, is a huge, huge problem. And it's, this, and it's the same, same sort of mentality where I'm not going to get caught. But anyway, not to linger too much on that, and uh, uh, we'll have more on the Smith State uh, Smith State College, huh. uh, Smith State yeah. <laughs> Penitentiary, uh, and, and later shows that as that 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 case is going to be ongoing for a while. But what in the hell is wrong with Daphne Totten? I mean, that's a question we've asked a lot on this show, um, and no doubt a question we will continue to ask, but um, this week it's a couple things. There are a couple stories that, um, and and it's funny. It's well, it's not that funny, but just <laughs> just this week I was like, gosh, I haven't written about her in a while because I haven't been covering court stuff as much. I've been covering a lot of GDC stuff. The legislature's in, and that's the problem with being a freelance person, so to speak, and and not having you know a team of people is that. It's only the stuff that I can go to. And of course, like whenever I go to something that usually um, gets all the like, it's never just whatever I see there. It's usually attached to something else, which causes me to end up down a rabbit hole or something or the other. So it's a lot of times there'll be like periods of time where I spend a week on GDC and then a week on this or a week on that. But anyway, this week it's it's Daphne Damasery and um, on Tuesday, we found out that a man who had spent 1,176 days in the Bullock County Jail was acquitted of child molestation, and um, which is 39 months, by the way. But basically, the short version of the story is that um, a man named Charles Henderson was charged by law enforcement in November of 2019 with one count of child molestation and one count of aggravated child molestation. And um, then he was indicted by a grand jury, as of course, and held without bond for all of COVID. Um, and he got a he had he went through a public defender, and then he had a private attorney, and he waived his right to a jury trial, which is always an interesting um, decision because, of course, a judge knows the law more than a jury might, but in some ways that might work against. A person, so it's it's very uncommon 
Like we talked about there being a bench trial in the case with the the fire extinguisher and the DUI and stuff like that. But asking for a bench trial on something like this is just um, it's it's not as common. So anyway, um, there was a a couple day bench trial back in November of 2022, um, and. The short of what came out during that testimony is that, or during that trial, is that um, the state had offered this man 15 years to serve in prison, followed by a lifetime on the sex offender registry, a period of probation, and, um, you know, they were acting like they offered a, a, a bone to this guy. And he was accused um, of, it's it's quite awful, but... When you hear what follows, it's, you know. But he was accused of basically using a knife to cut open the pajamas of a nine-year-old girl um, whom he shared a house with and then assaulting her with his hands. Um, And we found out during the trial that the mother, who was married to the man who was accused of this behavior, they had been on the rocks. She'd been talking about divorce. They'd wanted to you know, they'd been talking about, she'd been wanting to divorce him. They'd been fighting a lot. Um, she collected all the evidence herself, took her daughter to the, the hospital and, um, provided the, the items, so to speak, to the daughter or to the law enforcement, um, officers who met her there and conducted the interview. And they never sent the stuff off to be tested. Um, they never, she, you know, the pajamas, they accused him of using some sort of oil substance. Um, there was none of that found on the forensic examination of the young girl. All these things. And we also found out that um, there she had never suspected him of this before. No one in the family had. There was no history of this. And, which often there is not. But, um, you know, it literally came out of nowhere. And then... We found out that the week before the trial, there was a supposedly another alleged incident where he, the man put his hand on the thigh of this girl. and But that all came out of the DA's office almost as if the DA's office had coached the statement out of the young girl, who's now 12. Um, which, on a side note, it's a lot to ask a 12-year-old to recall. Granted, Something three years ago. Right. And granted, it, if it if it did happen, I'm sure it was traumatic and those types of things. But, like, that's still a lot to ask somebody to do. And they actually didn't – she testified, but they actually didn't ask her very many questions. They relied on her video interview, which conflicted with her mother's testimony, the grandmother's testimony, and even her own testimony on the stand. Um, so, basically, after this trial, there was no evidence um, – to support claims of child molestation or aggravated child molestation. However, the judge wanted to review the video um, of her interview and and the transcript, of course, to, to revisit everything. And that was in November. And then just this week, he entered the not guilty verdict. And so after 39 months of waiting in jail, this man who has been charged with child molestation, whose wife divorced him, which it sounds like that was coming anyway, but like ha- lost everything basically. Um, it's just supposed to be like, okay, well, thanks, thanks for the time away, and that's it. Like that's the end of it. Like nothing happened after three years, over three years. First, I'll say, as far as bench trials go, maybe if Ashlyn Griffin. Did a bench trial should be free today? Um, maybe depending on the judge. Maybe. Well, at least the judge is able is uh, is not going to do a, a a bargain to to either he comes with a verdict or not. Oh well, that's and if true. Doesn't, yeah, because that that was a negotiated uh, uh, verdict. Sentence that right. that actual reference. But anyway, that's not that's not the point. Look, this this guy lost three years and a quarter. Of his life, his reputation has been run run into the ground, ruined. How how do you explain to the next employer where the hell you've been the last three years? Mm-hmm. I mean, what, what if you when you get you get get somebody's work history and says, "Well, you worked here, you worked here," then there's a gap of three and three years. 
how how do you how do you get that right? How do you get that back? I mean, I know this is not the most egregious thing. We, somebody just got out of prison last week, and I can't remember where it was. But after thirty years uh, 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 with a murder conviction, they got overturned. Uh, Totten's office is just is just is just a damn mess. It doesn't make any sense that he would take a knife and cut her pajamas. Well. I mean, the whole she the claim was that she was pretending to be asleep and she said that she didn't first she in an interview she said that she was screaming in pain and crying and her brother was supposedly on the couch like the adjacent couch but he never woke up and they never even interviewed him or had him as a witness and then in the video she said that um she her like in the interview her mother said that she didn't wake up and she didn't know anything until two o'clock she thought maybe she just like wet her pants and then the next morning was when she she found out that the man had been out there like all these things that just didn't add up and you know but it doesn't it doesn't make sense on on pajamas uh i mean i i i i, I know what pajamas look like and they they're a little too tight to just take a knife and sit Okay, bust a seam on them while somebody's wearing them. I mean, that's that'd be tough to first of all to do it even with somebody's awake and tell you tell them not to hold still. But it'd be really hard to, you know, use a knife in a clandestine manner to mm-hmm. to to get pajamas off. It just it, it doesn't make any sense. Then of course you said the the oil that that was wasn't wasn't found. And again, that doesn't make any sense. None of it makes any sense. Well, and, and, the I, and I'm not saying the guy, the guy. I was just, I, I don't, I don't know if the guy's a creep or not. I have no idea. But what was being presented didn't make any sense, and that's up to Daphne Totten in her office to say this doesn't make sense. No right. process this damn thing. Right, and the question is always supposed to be, can you prove it? in court and that's supposed to be the standard and that was not the standard um it's never the standard and and i mean i hate to say this because it sounds cold but our da's office obviously has a big problem with not telling people i'm not saying this didn't happen but we don't have any evidence to prove it like i don't understand why it's so um I guess, taboo to explain the legal process. Like people, you're going to make people mad. And instead of making them mad three years ago because you can't move forward with this, the mother was on Facebook. In my article, I made sure not to even mention the mother's name or the grandmother's name out of respect for the privacy of the minor child because we live in a world where everyone has the internet. Like the last thing her friends need, like it's just, it's not appropriate. And she's also a minor, like it's, it does not appropriate. But, um, I made sure not to mention her. Well, her mother gets on all of the Facebook posts this morning from the Georgia virtue and, you know, starts running her mouth about how the people in the trial let this man walk free and, you know, the system this and the system that. And I mean, nobody let him walk free. But. No. Uh, no that's, then that's the thing is, is you have to have integrity and be able to say, look, this, that this case is a dog. It's not a winner. You don't want to say the case is a dog to, to, when there's a victim. I, I say that with civil cases a lot of times. Uh, you certainly want to say that about a criminal case, especially when, when there is an alleged victim. But you say, I can't win this case with the evidence uh, that, that we have. I can't, I, we, we can't win. So that, well, and she struck out again last week. And that, that poor guy was in, was in jail for three years and, and three months, three and a quarter. Mm-hmm. This person and- got to sit in jail for 30 something days. She did. And this Horrible is a story. story where you're just like, huh? Like, how did this, how did this, I mean, it's not Ashlyn Griffin on this, the sense of Ashlyn Griffin, but it's Ashlyn Griffin on the sense of, in the sense that like every step of the way was a complete and utter failure. So basically, um, 
In October 2020, a woman was traveling on a state highway. It's a two-lane road in, um, like, going towards the interstate. But she was going towards the next county when she struck a deer and in trying to she tried she swerved to try to avoid striking the deer which was not um successful and then she collided with a tree her car immediately burst into flames and she was knocked out by the airbag and regained consciousness while the car was on fire don't know how long she was out but she was um experienced severe head trauma got out of her car and sort of it was in the middle of the, it was late at night but um got out of the car started um knocking on doors asking for help and going to the um you know she went up the road to the ga- uh, gas station after having an unsuccessful attempt at knocking on someone's door but what we found out during the trial and through the discovery that was um prepared quote by the state is that um, so a homeowner called 911 and said, a woman's knocking on my door. She's saying that she was involved in an accident with a deer. While the deputy was on his way there, um, he saw that a vehicle was on fire, which the sheriff's office had been notified by another drive- driver that there was a car on fire. And um, while he was, he extinguished the fire to the extent that he could and then waited for the fire department. And while he was on the scene of that, the wrecked vehicle, The driver called from the gas station up the road where she had walked and identified herself and said, I need help. I've been in a wreck. Um, You know, blah, blah, blah. EMS comes, takes her to the hospital because she has serious head trauma. So then the homeowner who called initially calls back and says, "Uh, two guns were stolen from my car. And so another deputy goes to his house and reports back that the woman was seen on the security footage with an unknown male at the time of the incident and so they divide up the investigation to the crash investigation and the thing on the homeowner's property well the homeowner supposedly told deputies that this woman showed up she said i'm it's been an accident he said i'm calling law enforcement she said i don't need law enforcement i And he said that she said, I don't need law enforcement. And she left. But testimony later said that she actually said, I don't need the police. I need help, which would lead someone to believe that she needs like medical help or something. But anyway. um, Yeah, she 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 took a she took a punch to the head. Yes. And if you if you read the article on the the Georgia Virtue, like the car is completely engulfed in flames and within the trees. Like she lost control of her vehicle and the car was a total loss, um, which was never disputed by anyone. Like the car was completely obliterated. So um, apparently the homeowner got in his car, drove down the road to see if she was actually in a wreck. And he looked at his security camera footage when he got back and said that he discovered there was a male inside the vehicle and he could hear the male urging the female to go to the front door and ask for help while he went to the back of the residence. Um, and then he reported that the two guns were missing. Well, later he testified at trial that maybe there were four guns in his car. He wasn't sure. And we also found out that um, he actually called the sheriff's office back at one point and told him to take one of the guns off the NCIC database because he it, he found it. Um, so I say all that to say that this is a guy who just has a lot of guns and doesn't keep a good inventory of them. But it gets worse. So the homeowner sent the videos to the sheriff's office for their investigation. And he had said that there was a mail on them that you could hear all this stuff. Well, that's not true. Like the clips that they sent, they sent four videos and I looked at them and I also read the sheriff's office summary of them and there's no mail to be seen there's no mail to be heard all you hear is this woman in different clips saying is anyone home help help hello is anyone here i'm sorry to bother you i just got in a wreck a deer ran out in front of me my car hit a tree and it blew up um and then she like she walked out of the frame of the video and you can hear at one point you can hear a car door close and she appears in a jacket um, and then she's seen in another video, not in the jacket. So, but there's no videos of the man. There's no video of the exchange reportedly by the, between the homeowner and her. Um, and you know, it's not ever mentioned in the report because it wasn't in there. 
So she speaks with investigators and she admits that, you know, she said she wasn't alone in the vehicle. She came to while the vehicle was on fire. She didn't gather anything. She just climbed out of the car. And when she was at the homeowner's house, she was looking. No one answered the door immediately because I'm assuming they were talking to her through the ring um, voice system. But um, she said, I wasn't trying to steal anything. I was looking for a phone or something so I could call 911, which is obvious by the fact that she didn't stick around long. And she walked to the, the gas station, and which is across the highway, by the way. Um, and it's pitch black dark and she walked there to, to identify herself and the cop told her, the investigator told her, well, you're on camera stealing something. And she said, well, I didn't, I didn't steal anything. I, I took a jacket, but that was it. And, um, he didn't mention the guns or he mentioned the guns, but she said, I, you know, I didn't take any guns. I don't have the guns. So then she, um was later located and was that was during an investigation hold they had they had arrested her cuz she left the hospital apparently which i don't i didn't know that that was a problem cuz they charged her with hit and run and for leaving the scene of the accident on foot and she left the hospital on foot i mean i didn't know that if you went to the hospital you had to stay there until they said you could go um cuz she didn't know she was being detained or she'd done any, like that she didn't know that they were and also how do you charge someone with hit and run for hitting a deer in a tree? Like, who's the victim? But they the, they charged her with hit and run. They charged her with failure to maintain lane for leaving her lane for hitting the deer. Charged her with expired license and no proof of insurance. And then they issued a warrant for felony entering auto. Um, because she unlawfully entered the vehicle and stole a jacket. And again, she took the jacket out of the car. The minute she took the jacket out of the car... I mean, you know, it, I don't know. Is it if, at, at all possible she grabbed the jacket to see if a cell phone was in it so she could call 911? Because even without po- unlocking a phone, you can hit emergency and call 911. Possibly. Or, you know, I don't know. If you've ever seen cops and you see someone in trauma, they usually put a jacket over them or a blanket or something after they've been in trauma because their body could be in shock. You don't know if she was cold or if she – like, we don't know. I mean, but it was a jacket, not – I mean, I, I don't know. I, she, I failed. She didn't I, bust. The, she didn't bust the window. Who get, who gets in a fiery auto crash, and then goes and starts stealing guns and jackets, and then calls the police. Nobody. Um, the 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 dude saying I, I don't I don't know what his motivation was to say the guns were stolen. I have no idea. Uh, uh, he, at bare minimum, he he should have his his butt whooped for saying he had four unsecured firearms in, in an, an unlocked, unlocked vehicle. Right. And he's not even sure which ones that he owns that were in there. I mean, that's just irresponsible. But um anyway. So yeah, she I, she was so, acquitted of the of the so of the major crimes that she was they, she didn't even, spent, they didn't even take the hit and run to court. No, they never accused that. They the other everything went through the accu- accusation process as opposed to the grand jury process, and they didn't come forward with the hit and run charge because, I mean, that's intended for property or another vehicle. I mean, yeah, that it's, duty it's, upon striking striking object. Right, it's uh, very. Clear. I'm surprised they didn't get her for vehicular manslaughter or cruelty to animals, knowing Barclay Black and Daphne Totten. Felony murder, man. Um, and I think it's important to note, too, that they didn't even investigate this as a DUI. So and that's usually I mean, failure to maintain lane because you left this, an accident like you left the roadway because you hit a deer. I mean, if that's the case, every just about every person who's ever hit a deer would be guilty of, of that offense. But um, during the trial, yeah, they, unless you're driving in a dump truck and you just plow through the deer. Yes, yes. Uh, you you fail to maintain a lane when uh, uh, when you, I've I've hit deer before, when when that sucker uh, hits you and and in my case it was a long time ago bent up the hood of the car so I couldn't see went flying over the back of the car, so yeah I think I, I think I may have swerved after that after that. Right. Well, and uh. so the guns never. I mean, they came up at trial, but not as a pivotal point because the homeowner testified that there might have been four and you know he's not really sure um 
they never presented any evidence that she stole anything other than taking the jacket. And and also, I mean, you're talking about someone who has head trauma and who was treated for head trauma. And so it's it's it, it's let's just say she did take the jacket. She didn't take it from the scene. But like we can assume that she was disoriented. So why would you not like this? This whole thing of not giving people any sort of benefit of the doubt unless you have because the whole charge is entering auto with the intent to commit theft or a felony. Like, what was her intention? Show me the intent. Show me that you can, beyond a reasonable doubt, that you know she wanted to do something illegal. So, not, the jury... Not, go ahead. Not just that. Uh, being experienced with, with concussions, you don't always remember what happened directly after your concussion. Or sometimes directly before the concussion. It wouldn't have shocked me if she's if she had no idea that she hit a deer. She just woke up with a car on fire, couldn't figure out what's going on. It's, I mean, the when you get your when you get your 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 noggin scrambled like that, it it takes a while. And if, when they said they were treating for severe head trauma, the last place I would want to recover from a concussion is jail. Right, and she spent thirty six days there. Um. That was 28 months ago, and she finally got bond, whatever, after her 36 days. But um, the jury trial started at, I think, 9 a.m. They heard a couple hours of evidence, and by lunchtime, they had a verdict of not guilty of the failure to maintain lane charge, not guilty of the felony entering auto. And then, of course, she they were they did find her guilty of the two traffic citations because she had no proof of insurance and her license was expired. I mean, that happens to people that I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make it OK. I'm not suggesting that. But like that happens to people all the time. They're misdemeanors. We'd usually just don't waste any resources. You know, yeah, that goes to, that goes to state court. court. Right. Yeah, that, 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 that goes to state court and it's a it's a fine and don't do it again. And Barkley Black said he wanted her to spend time in jail for the traffic offenses, six months in the county jail for a freaking expired license and no proof of insurance at the time of the incident. Um, I mean, not to mention that not, ha- I mean, whether like if she didn't have proof of insurance, that there was a lapse or if she didn't have it at all, I mean, isn't it punishment enough that your car is not going to be re- replaced because you wrecked it? It was a total loss. Like I, I, I don't see the point. Jail is for people who are too dangerous for society. That is what jail is for. And to advocate for six months in the county jail is is an atrocity by Barkley Black. Um, and the judge was like, no, the jury has spoken. She'll get a suspended sentence of 12 months and she'll pay a $175 fine. And that's it. Yeah, I, there's got there needs to be a class action lawsuit or a multi-party lawsuit against uh totten's office i mean uh, you, you told it up in one of your stories how many days people have stayed in stayed in jail to be acquitted seven thousand eight hundred and sixty two days under daphne totten which is the equivalent of 21 and a half years there needs to be some some sort of accountability when it comes to prosecutors on this stuff especially when you, when you go into court with such was such weak evidence like like with the with the molestation case i'm not making a lot of molestation obviously but no but what can you prove there there's no evidence but you you kept the guy in jail for three years you put this girl in jail for for uh for over a month and then tried to try to throw her in the slammer for another six months for lack of insurance and and uh expired license it wasn't it was not suspended it was expired and when whenever I read stories like this, I kind of look. I have to go look at my license because I don't know when the hell my license expires. Well, I mean, even cops will say that expired license is a minor traffic offense. Like, doesn't make you a hardened criminal. Right now, this is a good time to remind you these, these are our opinions and not those of anyone, not on the show or any respective company for which we may work, own, or otherwise associate ourselves with on a regular or irregular basis. Also, you can find other episodes and relevant stories over the GeorgiaVirtue.com. Jessica, you've got the mule. 
I do have the mule this week because um, State Senator Emanuel Jones compared Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas to one who sold his soul to the slave masters as the Senate um, had their little debate on putting a statue in the Georgia Capitol in Thomas's honor. Now, I've talked about it at length. I don't, I'm not in favor of putting up statues or any type of honor, not even road signs for people who are still alive. I think it's inappropriate. I think it's for something that happens after they're dead, if you want to do that. Um, but I think it's completely disrespectful to a su- sitting Supreme Court justice to say something like that. His quote was, I'm just trying to tell you what we have in the African-American community when we talk about a person of color that goes back historically to the days of slavery and that person betraying his own community. We have a term in that black community and it's uncle Tom. Uncle Tom is either a fictional character or a non-fictional character. I don't really know the origin of uncle Tom, but it talks about a person who back in the days of slavery sold his soul to the slave masters. How, how do you not know uncle Tom's cabin? How, how do you get? Well, how are you going to use that? And not know. And not know what, not even know the frame of reference. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely the jackass of the week. I mean, look, Daphne Totten could be the jackass of every week. She'll win the, she'll win the, the mule of the year. I'm sure. I mean, somebody, in order to beat Daphne Totten, somebody's going to have to really come up on the outside to overtake her because she's way in the lead for mule of the year. Mm-hmm. I agree. So, Georgia bill would allow state to create homeless camps. Old Cardin Summers from Cordell. Um, this is the second year in a row that he's offered this bill, Senate Bill 62. And um, it's a it's a little bit different from last year's bill, which last year it was it made it a misdemeanor to camp on public property um, and denied state grants to cities that didn't enforce the ban. And he got so much blow bl- back, blow black, blowback from that bill that they had a study committee on it made 26 recommendations over the summer he you know backtracked and said i never wanted to criminalize any person sleeping on the street or the sidewalk which is hilarious because the bill literally made it a crime to sleep on the street or the sidewalk but besides the point this year um he came back and um had a a less harsh bill that as, as he would like to say, I guess, that cracks down on homelessness um, and it creates a structure for the state to designate camping areas for homeless people. And then they would audit state and local governments and how they're spending money to actually like alleviate the problem. Um, and I, I think that- it's h- hilarious mm-hmm. that he wants to create a, like a Republican wants to create a like a, a homelessness zone. Yeah, that the. All right. Th- if that bill would have become law, they are begging to be sued. Begging for it. Look, uh, homeless camps are are often dens of of violence. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, drug use. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a bunch of people who, I, 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 all homeless aren't, aren't violent, obviously. A lot of, almost all of them have, have mental problems. You know, most people don't become homeless because they missed a mortgage payment. Uh, and most people, you know, most people become homeless because they miss payments because they pay their dealer. Um, but we know that in these camps, the, uh, there's sexual assault, there's violent assault, and now you're you're essentially sanctioning it by putting it, putting them in an, in an internment camp. You can exist right here and do whatever you want. I I, I look. I don't I don't like seeing homeless people either. And I I would I would love for everybody to have a home. But I'd I'd love for the people that need help to get the help they need. But God Almighty, putting up a fence and th- and throwing them in there and say you 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 can live there. Not a great idea. Not a good look for the state. No. And the amount of resources and time it's going to take to do this, like, couldn't you actually do something to relieve? I mean, the well, problem that, yeah, that exists? It reminds me of Hoovervilles, which were the, the homeless camps that popped up during the Depression. 
that they were, you know, they were, you know, walled off and, 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 you know, there was Hoovervilles in, in Central Park. It's, I don't, I don't have a good solution to homelessness. I don't, I'm not, I'm not an idealist that thinks that it's a housing problem. It's not, uh, I'm not so naive as to think that, well, they just don't have the proper places to camp. No, that's not, that's not, that's not it. Our problems are, are mental health and drug addiction. And those, and those two problems are often intertwined. I mean, it, you, you gotta, you gotta believe that drug addiction is, is a disease when you would rather sleep on a sidewalk so you could get your fix. That, you know, as bad as you're looking around you is not say, you know what? I need to put this crap down. This is, you know, this is not where, where I want my life going. Yeah, it's just, it's not a good, it's not a good look. It's not a good plan. It's not a. Well, yeah, just... wait till the damn thing catches fire. Wait till they're trying to, trying to warm themselves up in wintertime in, uh, in Atlanta somewhere when, it, when it's eight degrees outside and somebody builds a fire and burns the thing down and end up with dead people. But they were, they were in within your allowed uh, urban outdoors area. I, I, it, the, I think the bill's a loser. I, I, don't, I don't think it, it's not going to solve the homeless problem. It's not going to contain it. It's not going to keep people from begging for change. I, I don't know what he thinks he's doing with this bill. But it's, it's not going to have the intended result. You know, no, we're not just going to start walking out on the streets in Atlanta and not see homeless people. Right. But that's not all he has up his sleeve. No, it's not. He also um, says he wants to stop teachers from talking to students about gender identity. But he admits the bill remains full of unintended consequences and might need to be redrafted. Um, so it's why the, drop it? <laughs> it's called the Parents and Children Protection Act of 2023. It's Senate Bill 88. If anybody, I mean, obviously it'll be linked on the show site and on George Virtue, but if anybody wanted to look it up, it's Senate Bill 88. But um, supposedly it's already on its second draft. Um, and he says that it's necessary to keep teachers from indoctrinating their students about changing gender identity and to keep teachers from hiding a student's gender identity from parents, which is a, I mean, that's a bogus, that wild concept anyway. But um, he said, we're simply trying to limit the exposure that a person would have on a child regarding gender. That's where it's at. They're not supposed to talk to your child about gender without permission from the parent. Again, uh, Summers and I have the same goal where schools aren't being used as indoctrination, where uh, your kids aren't uh, aren't being taught the reason that you, you feel like an outcast is because you're actually a boy in a girl's body or vice versa. Um. If it doesn't, who can the students go to? If you say a student is having issues and they, and they want to talk to somebody, they don't want to talk to their parents, but they are having issues. They are, they are having questions. Who do they talk to? They can't go to a trusted teacher, can't go to the school counselor, can't talk to the school administration. Who do you go to? And there may be people, have people with legitimate questions about it. You know, is this why I feel lonely? Blah, blah, whatever it is. Uh, do I want the indoctrination? Of course not. Do I think the vast majority of the, first, primarily the female to male uh, transgenderism is, 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 do I think it's linked to mental illness? Of course. Uh, do, I, do, do When we find true transgenderism, we find it overwhelmingly male to female. Overwhelmingly, it presents itself very early in life. Very, very early in life. Uh, and even with, with little kids, you find them starting to the, hurt themselves and, and, you know, not like, you know, not, not like the equipment they were, they were given. And overwhelmingly, this is what we see with, with body dysmorphia like that. We don't see it where a bunch of girls start hanging out with each other. And one girl says, I'm transgender. And another girl says, so, so, well, then so am I. That overwhelmingly, that's, that's not, that's not the way mental illness works. You can't catch crazy from somebody unless you marry them. 
Lord. <laughs> but and again, I, I agree with with the with the sentiment that we don't want our public schools being turned into uh, any sort of political rec- recruitment tool uh, or any or any sort of, uh, of 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 woke indoctrination. We don't want that in, in our schools. But if they're getting enough of it on MTV, on Reddit, on I say MTV. Kids probably don't even watch MTV anymore. But. I, no, we want schools to be a safe place for, for kids to go and learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. But the ways going about it, again, just like with the, with the homeless thing, is bass backwards. All well, right. Jo- yeah, I just, I was going to say, if you have to say it about your own bill, right. it sucks. Yeah, you stand up, I really suck at writing bills, but here it is. <laughs> Gave it the best he could. Yeah, would you if if he said the same thing about his bills as a chef said about their food? Would you would you want to eat in that restaurant? No. Yeah, it's probably needs to be recooked. But here, so Georgia senators announce a bill to uh, restrict vaping in public spaces. Yeah, they want to add this is Senate Bill Forty Seven. Senate's really been cranking along this last week. Um, they voted fifty one to three on Wednesday to regulate vaping in the same clean air smoke free act of, of Georgia that has been in place for cigarettes for and you know cigars and all the rest for I don't know how long a long long time so yeah that was um, Sonny Purdue yep I remember so, when that happened because I knew a lot of bar owners that were not happy no it definitely uh, changed a lot of things well, a lot of drinkers smoke when they drink. Even people who aren't smokers, smokers, not you know somebody who's not a two-pack-a-day smoker will get out to happy hour. And I, I'm, I'm talking about professionals, doctors, lawyers. They'll get that, that third or fourth beer in them and go, hey, can I get one of those? Uh, so bar owners saw it, saw it as, uh, as uh, good for business. And Sonny Purdue's reasoning at the time, uh, this is... Hmm. early 2000s uh, reasoning at the time for going across the board with it was he didn't want a patchwork of county uh, municipality to municipality county to county with smoking restrictions in bars because that would pit a bar in Gwinnett County against a bar in DeKalb County mm-hmm. now obviously you could b- true bars and I was talking about I was talking about bar restaurants like you know wing place or something like that that has happy hour but true bars that are 18 and up can allow smoking. Smoke shops can allow smoking. Uh, there's a couple other things, but do, do you see vaping being a problem? Well, I was just about to say, I mean, I've seen people vaping in public spaces before, but um, I mean, I've never been in, in a place at all that's just inundated where you can't, I mean, you could make... I don't know. I guess I also feel like smoking is a lot more offensive and in the, literally in the faces of the people around than vaping. Yeah, it stinks. I mean, I remember coming home from clubs and things like that when I was younger. And everything you wore had came off immediately, immediately went to the laundry. Mm-hmm. Like, like it's, I, I, I've asked people older than I am, I said... You know, how did the world smell in the 70s? Because I know how I how I smell when I, if I come out of a bar that allows smoking. You know, I, I, you know, I can, I, I, it's, it's, it, you know, I, I smell until I can get these clothes off, get in the shower and scrub, you know, that that smoke stinks. But, you know, people used to be able to smoke in line at the bank. There used to be ashtrays at the teller counter. You used to smoke on planes. Right. And, and of course, there's been a lot more evidence and stuff that's come out and and that has changed the trend of that. I mean, we all understand that, but I just, I don't, I don't see vaping on the same level, I guess. Well, yeah, because it's not offensive to everybody else. If it's not good for the person vaping, that that's their personal choice. They're, well, now over 21, but they're, they're, they're functioning adults and they can make their own decisions if, if they want to vape. 
uh, it does it doesn't affect me. Now, if you're just an a hole and go blowing vape in people's faces, I mean that's that's you, you being an a hole. But if you're and I, I don't know any bars that that allow it. I don't know any restaurants that allow it. Used to be uh, when vaping first started the, uh, with electronic cigarettes as a stop smoking aid. Yeah, you could sit at a table in a restaurant and someone go, Are "You smoking? No, it's it's e cigarette." Oh, okay, and they just walk away. But I, I I don't I don't see this I don't see this as a problem. I don't see it as something that really needs to be addressed. Maybe it's because I don't live in a college town. Maybe it's because I don't go out to places where a bunch of people are standing around vaping. Wow. Of course, if I don't see it, it's not a problem, right? Of course. Of course. (laughs) That's how I feel about the homeless. I don't see them. (laughs) All right, Jessica, let's get to your closing thought. Um, It's short and sweet. So Marjorie Taylor Greene this week said that um, Nikki Haley you know, who obviously announced her presidential bid this past week, called she called her a bush in heels. And I just, I mean, so I'm all about calling people out when they, like, no matter what side of the aisle they're on, when they suck. And if you think me, Nikki Haley sucks, then I support your decision to support someone else. And, um... I don't know, but I, I don't understand why Marjorie takes the approach she takes. And I don't, especially like I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm the world's worst feminist. We talk about this all the time on the show, but like women in politics and women running for president is not an easy feat. It's a different, it's a different beast. And I don't think you gain anything by saying someone's a bush in heels. Yeah. I think it's an it's a irresponsible way to. Well, I mean, but, but she's, she's made her career doing stuff like that. I just, I, I, I don't get it either. But she just, it, it's, it's like she gets some sort of validation when she says stuff like that from from the from the uh, true Trump, you know, MAGA people. Yeah, you know, I'm not talking about Trump voters. I'm talking about the people that show up at the rallies, the people that have the hats. The people that show up at Marjorie Green stuff. Uh, uh, that's that's her core, and none of the stuff that she says is going to hurt her out here. No, that's true. It's true. It's um, it, that that that's that's just that's just a fact. And look, we have the same had the same thing with Diane Feinstein. She could say whatever she wanted; it was never going to hurt her in California. Who's retiring? All right, from Bush and Hills to the Wienermobile. The Wienermobile, Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, was in Las Vegas, parked somewhere near the Strip. The drivers get into this thing, go to start it up, it doesn't turn over. Someone stole the catalytic converter off the damn thing. (laughs) Couldn't you pick a less conspicuous vehicle to climb under and steal something out of? Like, because they're not just, I mean, when when you see the the Wienermobile parked somewhere, it, it, it draws the eye. Wouldn't be the first place I go to. I go to steal something. It is but that was great. Funny. So yeah, Vegas has got uh, Wienermobile dysfunction. So on that note, big thanks to Eric Cumby, our editor, who takes our awful audio, and makes it something that into something that you can listen to. Jessica Salaji, the brains of the operation, the writer and genius. I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week. Catch me howling at the moon